Okay. Here we go. There is in social sciences, and particularly in sociology, but not only in sociology, a tendency to use certain magical words, to do magic. Do you know some magical words, maybe? Abracadabra. Well, yes, <laughs> but it's not so simple <laughs> in sociology. Do you know some, maybe? No magical word? Ah, it's no, sorry. Paradigm discourse. Paradigm discourse, system, complexity. Another one is social construction. Everybody talks about it. Few people can explain in detail what they mean by social construction. Uh, so, some social sciences have a tendency to produce a hermetic language which I don't find very nice, even though I enjoy using sometimes these words because they just sound good. Uh, you know, they are very nice on the tongue. But still, from time to time, we also have to consider what is uh, behind those words. Can we really give them a meaning? Can we show what they mean in detail? how they work in reality. So if you tell me, can you tell me what this is? A wheelchair. Uh, can you tell me what this is? Also a wheelchair. What's the difference besides the material? <laughs> yes. Sorry? Well, it doesn't seem very stable. Is yeah. this the only difference? Oh, no, it's made of wood. It's made of wood, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody know the teddy bears? You know these fluffy bears that you had when you were young? Uh, so Margarete Steif was the inventor. It's working now. The lady found the solution. Um, yeah, she invented the, the teddy bear. And she used this one during her life. She had a, a how do you say, uh, this illness that was very strongly distributed with kids. Polyamilitis. Sorry? Poliomyelitis. Right, yes. Uh, but do you see any difference? I mean, besides the material? Number of wheels. Number of wheels, true, yes. But. Sorry, how? We should, we should define somehow different. But we can even like make two chairs and yes. they're different in their respects. They are different in many respects. But we're all social scientists. And I was asking the social scientific view on this. Okay. They seem to function in the same way, so it's, there is no yeah. basic. I see your argument, but I'm sorry you are wrong. <laughs> so they don't. <laughs> don't function in the same way, simply because the position of the big wheel is different. Have you ever observed the person uh, using a modern wheelchair? He or she usually is able to move herself very easily, to move over a little step, things like that. But Margarete Steif was not able to do all this. Maybe she could move a bit by pushing her front big wheels. But in reality, this old-fashioned style of wheelchair was not very useful with, uh, uh, when you wanted to move yourself. So the difference, in a way, as far as I see it as a social scientist, is how these objects incorporate a representation of handicap. How handicap is being perceived today and 100 years ago, which is the difference that uh, when you were a handicapped person 100 years ago, you were not supposed to move yourself. You were supposed to be accept uh, help from somebody. 
to push you, to help you with the wheelchair, etc., etc. Whereas nowadays the whole construction is focused onto a onto an autonomy of the handicapped person, no? that he or she can move. And I remember vividly a very impressive event or experience that I had when I was at the University of California in Los Angeles. There we had an Indian colleague who was handicapped in a wheelchair. And one evening, a group of us, we went across the campus to a, to a restaurant, and he was with us. And somehow, automatically, I, without much thinking, I, I helped him push the wheelchair. And he immediately said, no, stop, I want to do it myself. So that's a difference, no? And it makes, uh, it shows very well, I think, how technology incorporates uh, representations that exist at different times. So that's Margarete Steiff again in a different wheelchair but with the same problem, namely the big wheels in the front. Uh, here we have Confucius who also <laughs> used the wheelchair uh, depending on a slave behind. And this is a very modern wheelchair where you can even run races. Um, different mental contents that are shared in the society materialize in different ways in, in objects. Now let's come to a fundamental process, or let's say interpersonal process of uh, individual influence and how the behavior of another person influences us in our behavior. So the question is, how does the interaction between two people convey behavioral preferences to the other person? And this is an experiment, has been an experiment by Snyder and Swan, who showed how expectations and behaviors are communicated indirectly across generations of experimental subjects. They had this very simple design. They used uh, 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 an experimental game, let's say a computer game between two people. This game could be played aggressively, competitively, or it could be played more peacefully, let's say a conciliatory way, in a conciliatory way. So we had in total three generations of people. The first generation here was, uh, were subjects who were instructed either to expect a competitive partner or to expect the second condition, to expect a conciliatory partner. And uh, these people in the two groups then played uh, against the real second person, that was the so-called naive, naive uh, subjects. I was just try to put this away because it's in the way. Okay, the, these two were playing and the other two were also playing. That was it. They played the game to the end. Then these were uh, leaving the laboratory and a new game was constructed with these people and other naive subjects coming in. They were again divided in two groups but there was no further instruction given to them. And then the naive person from this generation played against the other naive subjects. And at the end we asked this uh, the subjects from this generation, from the third generation, how they perceive their playing their game partner. And what they told us was that in the average they experienced the, their partner as competitive and the other group said in the average they experienced uh, their partner as being more or less conciliatory. But you should remember that these subjects never were instructed 
that they may meet a conciliatory or competitive person. They just got the experience from there, from this behavior of the first generation. And the behavior of the first generation due to the one-sided biased uh, instruction played differently in the two groups. And this different game or this different playing style uh, was uh, transported to the second generation. They had exactly the impression that uh, this generation was instructed to. And they conveyed this experience to the next generation, to the last, to the third. Uh, meaning that uh, whatever we do to somebody will have an effect on how this person behaves towards a third person. So we have a, a chain of reactions between uh, in communication patterns, in communication uh, chains, so to say, and in interaction chains, be uh, chains between people. Meaning that we change, in a way, every hour act. All our acting, all our talking has an influence on the world. So we are changing the world permanently by interacting with other people. Uh, okay. This is just a preliminary to the general topic of this hour on social construction. So one of the, there were several names connected to the term social construction in the history of social sciences. Uh, but one in social psychology who was important was Kenneth Gergen and he formulated four basic rules that are important when we talk about, about social reality. And these four basic rules are quite interesting and we should keep them in mind whenever we think about social facts. So what he says in the first basic rule is that what we take the experience of the world does not in itself dictate the terms by which the world is understood. So what we see here in a certain situation as being the state of the world is not really responsible for how we perceive this world. The, the reality is uh, reflected in different terms than it presents itself, so to say. Uh, there are many examples for this, and it's always about the reference between reality and what we think about reality. So the terms in which we understand the world has very little to do with the world itself. The second rule the terms in which the world is understood are social artifacts, products of historically situated interchanges among people. Okay, nothing new, nothing surprising for us, because we are all social scientists and know how, uh, what social construction is. But of course, we also know that uh, history and culture changes over time, and that the conception of a child is different from our uh, present conception and uh, behavior towards a child. Or just think of the of uh, an important topic in every pop song, it's love, also love, a romantic love, so we, as we understand it today, is not at all the normal way of two people uh, mixing, uh, in, of, of different gender mixing in a relationship that is called a love relationship because we know cultures where it's completely normal to have arranged marriages. And these arranged marriages are emotionally very different from what we consider to be a romantic love nowadays. The third rule is that the degree to which a given form of understanding prevails or is sustained across time 
is not fundamentally dependent on the empirical validity of the perspective in question, but on the vicissitudes of social processes that happen. Um, meaning that if I were living, let's say, 300 years ago, and I had some brilliant idea anticipating relativity theory of Einstein, um, I, I would be right in anticipating and, or reformulating a relativity theory, but the people wouldn't believe me because it's completely un, uh, impossible at this time to, uh, to how shall I say, to, to, to believe in something like relativity theory. It's even nowadays, it's difficult to imagine what it means, hundred years after its formulation. And there was in one example, Giordano Bruno, who many hundred years ago formulated the idea that, for example, the space where the stars are is endless, is infinite, has no border. But because of this, he was actually, uh, he was actually condemned to death on, on the, how do you say, the fire? The, sorry? Out of the fire. Out of the fire, yes. Okay, he was burned to death because he had this heretic belief. So he was right about infinity, but still nobody believed it and he died because of that. The fourth rule, is the forms of negotiated understanding are of critical significance in social life, as they are integrally connected with many other activities in which people engage. So how we describe and explain the world has consequences for the constitution of the world. Just remember the wheelchairs, how we, how we interpret it at a certain historical time, how we interpret handicap, so will be the material product for handicaps. It reflects in a way the, the kind of social thinking about handicap. And in this way, of course, everything is connected with everything else, but this is a, not a very sensible uh, utterance. Okay, let's take a different uh, turn. Let's look at this and uh, look at different levels of how we describe or how we can cope or how we can engage with reality. So first, there is of course something like the material level. Um, We can walk on the street, we can slip on the stones here, on the pavement. We can hit our head if there is a wooden, a wooden traverse or whatever in, our, in this height, etc. Even if we don't know what it is, it will hurt us. Then there is the representational level, that is, once we recognize that this is a, a, a certain way of paving the street that makes me, how do you call actually these cobblestones? Cobblestones, cobblestones yes. These cobblestone streets do have a certain tendency to be very slippery in the rain. So we better watch out. Once I recognize and call it cobblestones and all my background information about cobblestones is activated by using the term the cobblestones uh, attain a different character for me, and I walk differently. I engage with them differently. Then, uh, yeah, I engage differently. That's the action level. The representational level has to do also with the action level. And at the end comes out a social object. The cobblestones are not just anything in the world. It is. Once I name them as such, they have a history. They can be seen as being a, an allusion to a historical state because it's not a very modern 
paving of the street. It has to do with the production of cobblestones. And of course, you will know that in Estonia, there is no quarry where you can get granite from. You must import it from Finland. So there is a production process involved that you may have in your head when you think of cobblestones, etc., etc. So let's look at this uh, from the perspective of a chemist, maybe. Okay? So, uh, colleague, well, I give you something. What is this? Can you tell me? You don't know? So let's say it is just something in the world, in this world. This something, somebody looks at it, a chemist in this case, and the chemist may say, OK, according to my analysis, this is a piece of gold. Well, this is not, sorry, but uh, uh, something different, never, never mind. The scientific representation that the chemist invokes makes a lot of sense in chemistry. And it has also a name, it's called aurum, or gold in everyday language. On the level of action, the chemist will write a report about his analysis and be happy with that. And the social object that is being produced by this series of representation action and action uh, done by a chemist is something that we call a chemical element that has a, a meaning or a sense within the periodic system of elements and that has a certain atomic weight, in this case, 79. Let's look at Aztecs. An Aztec meeting such a something, and he may discover that this is gold, then he or she may, in his native language Nahuatl, represent it as Teocuitlatl. Teocuitlatl is the word Nahuatl word for gold, and implying different things for the Aztec. And these implications are very different from the implications for the chemist, of course. Uh, because in Nahuatl Aztec culture, the action level of gold, of the thing that we call gold, is for veneration, the gods, you know, venerating the gods, or to give it to guests as a, as a gift to guests, to uh, show their appreciation of, of a guest. And taken together, the social object is something like a holy material. A holy material that are used to celebrate the gods or that are used to show my appreciation to a guest. We all know that approximately at the time when the Aztecs lived, the Spanish arrived uh, as conquistadores and they also met this, they found this something in the world. And they applied a different representation to this thing. They applied a representation that accorded to the Spanish European representation of oro, of gold. Ah, God, wonderful. The action level was immediately different from the other two professions, which are respectively ethnic group. The European action level related to gold, as we all know, is accumulated, get as much as possible, and let's use it for buying stuff, for getting richer and more powerful, etc., etc. So the behavior towards this same thing that was before a something became completely different from, for example, the Aztecs and the chemists. And the social object that was formed out of it was a valuable material that can be used to make yourself rich. Three different things out of the same. Yes, in a way, actually the result is that we have three different social objects made out of one and the same something, depending on the action 
orientation. And depending on the representational system that you project onto it, that you apply to it. And uh, this again reminds us very much of the wheelchair example at the beginning. Depending on how in a group you represent something, the, in the same way you will orient or we'll have a different action orientation, orientation towards the object, and make a particular social object out of it that is particular in the sense of historically situated, and that is particularly uh, particular also with regard to the special group that is engaged in, in uh, interacting with this object. OK? So, if we look at social or societal events and issues that play a role in social life, then we, as social scientists, we can uh, look or try to determine what is the structure and what is the dynamics of these events. And coming back to our, all, all of our background, we can uh, try to determine where does the dynamics come from or the, where is the dynamics of social societal processes uh, located and where is the structure located. And I would suggest that uh, we try to locate the dynamics of social issues within the discourse that develops around it a discourse that involves the media as well as personal conversations. It's the process of coming to terms with a new, uh, with, with, with this something, with this something that enters our world. Uh, and the result of this interaction, of this discursive activity, is at the end the structure that is called a social representation. We will get into more details a little bit later. And finally, when these things get objectivated, the discourses get objectivated, that is, they become a material reality that we can touch, then we can talk about, about institutions or institutionalization. Institutions, in a way, are the materialized or reified ways of representing things. The abstract, I mean, it's easy with this material thing here that we can touch. We may easily understand, but it's even clearer if we think of such abstract terms as justice. What is justice? Justice is a very abstract thing. And even in one and the same society, there are different conceptions of justice. And exactly because of this, exactly because justice or the, the issue of justice, of finding justice, is a, is a contested issue. There is one institution that deals in every society with it. It may be in more, in simpler societies, may be the <coughs> the group of elders of a village that gathers together and tries to find a just, uh, a just uh, how do you say, judgment about some uh, uh, problem. Or in our, in our societies, we have the courts and the whole juridical system that is in the service of uh, producing justice. And this juridical system, we all know it is very big and has many, many different shades, many different sides. But it is, at the end, an institution, the materialized version of our representation of justice. A different topic is the abstract concept of God. I mean, right nowadays in the Near East, we see how different conception, conceptions of God can be used to slaughter and kill people, as we can 
uh, witness every day, unfortunately. Okay. So what is this course? This course, in a way, is a very general thing, actually. It's not only spoken words. In the uh, simplest understanding, we would say that this course can be all social interaction that has a communicative meaning. For example, talk is, of course, a communication form of communication. But there is also writing, of course. And there is any action that carries a meaning for other people. It's also a kind of discourse. Uh, and in a way, by doing this, it is also a construction of a local reality. That, uh, a construction that is, of course, limited by the discursive acts of other people that are present in the same in the same situation. And all this together defines debates and discussions. So this course is a very broad meaning. It does not only mean the written uh, reports in media, the talk that is permanently babbling around in a society that when we listen very intently outside of the window, we can hear thousands of millions of different people talking at the same time, you know, to each other, against each other, etc. But also the activity that we show with regard to others. Um, in terms of in terms of language structure, and if we restrict the term discourse to spoken language in the moment for our present purpose. This course is not located in the single word, of course not. It's not located in the single sentence, even though words and sentences are necessary for developing a discourse. It's not located in a series of sentences, but it's located, I would say, the minimum the minimum element of language that you can call a, a part of a discourse is a, is, a, is a paragraph. A paragraph in the written language constitutes the basic sense of or the basic element of uh, a, a, a discursive whole that may be present in the whole written text. So discourse is something very uh, very big, actually. And it's usually beyond the immediately written and formulated word. So, we define discourse in a very general way. Now let's quickly repeat what we understand as social representations. Of course, first, social representations consists of the ideas that we maintain about some certain object, just as the individual Aztec maintains an idea about the material of gold. And of course, there is a collective level of dealing and representing the objects that we call, uh, that uh, can, we can observe and have demonstrated actually in certain examples. If you remember the example of the social representation of conception, spermatoba. If we look at the at the different uh, how do you say commercials that use our representation of spermatoba in order to convey a commercial message, then this is clearly appealing to the collective level of our shared understanding of a biological process. And at the end, if we want to use a term or a sentence uh, suggested by Serge Moscovici, which I think is a very good sentence, by a social representation, we understand the elaboration of a social object in a community for the purpose of communication and interaction. Again, think, uh, think about the the uh, wheelchairs, 
and you will immediately see what it means to elaborate the social object for the purpose of interaction. For the purpose of interacting with a, with a handicapped person in different historical periods, we developed different, way, uh, uh, different things of, that we called wheelchair in these societies. OK, and to make all this clearer in a much more iconic form, I'm going to use now a study that we did some time ago uh, that I call a meta-empirical study. If you want to study discourse and the development of a social representation in the real life outside here, outside of the window, in the streets, in, in the pubs, in the bars, etc., or in the apartments, we could do this, but we need millions of euros as a budget because we need to observe a lot. We need to uh, write, transcribe a lot of uh, things that people say that they use the words and the sentences and the discourses that they use to communicate with each other. And out of this we would need hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of analysts who sit there and try to make a sense out of the, of the discourse that we recorded. So in order to do something similar, because this is out of the question on, in terms of economic uh, viability to go outside and really study how, how social construction works in everyday life, we decided to use a literary work. And in fact, we used the play by Arthur Miller that is called The Crucible. Has anybody heard about The Crucible? It's a piece that tells a very interesting story about witchcraft. Uh, and I, when I saw this in the theater one time, I thought, oh God, this is just a really wonderful example of how we can illustrate the process of social construction. And we, together with colleagues, we analyzed this piece and Thanks God, there is also a movie about this that I will use now to illustrate certain parts of the process of social construction. So what is this, the crucible about, in this book, this play, theater play? It's located a uh, long time ago, in 1692, and in a village that is called Salem, on the east coast of the United States in Massachusetts. This is a time of lots of insecurity. There have been natural disasters, there has been political turmoil, problems, etc. And all these insecurity, of course, in these little villages in the beginnings, at the beginning of, of, of the uh, United States, uh, created a feeling of uneasiness and a need for explanations. And this Quaker community, of course, had a strong Christian background in terms of religion and of philosophy. And uh, the, uh, this background will play a role in how they develop an idea or a social representation of witchcraft. The plot is more or less this. At the beginning, we, okay, Quaker community and their religion means, like the Muslim fundamentalists, that you should not be happy, you should just work. Hmm? That sounds similar in Estonia sometimes. Uh, <laughs> be it as it may, um, the idea that you should not have fun, that you should not dance, that you should not listen to music for your own fun, means that it's forbidden for kids even to have fun. But the girls from this uh, village one evening get together with Tituba. Tituba is a slave 
uh, there in one of the households in the forest, and there they do some, uh, some magic. No, and Tituba helps them to develop a magic in order to, to bewitch the beloved person. So he or she will discover that uh, he's loved and come to embrace the, embrace the, uh, the bride. And this activity is being discovered by the priest. The priest, by coincidence, passes by and can hear the music or the shouting of the girls. And he goes there, and from this terrible shock, two of the girls fall into unconsciousness. This unconsciousness lasts a few days, but at the end is being resolved. So they awake again, these girls. But this strange situation of having a, two girls in stupor who cannot move and who just don't open their eyes and don't respond, respond means that they are searching for an explanation of this. And the first explanation that you can find for something like this is calling this an activity of the double or uh, an activity of a witch. Uh, and out of this develops a very tragic dynamics. Who, who knows this story actually a little bit? You know it? Okay, the, the film is not so recent, but it still is a good illustration of that. Let's look at this. Yeah. <laughs> the, the usual. Oh, here we go. It's relatively quiet at the beginning. So these are the girls in the forest. That's the Tituba, the slave. They're doing some magic. Well, she's trying to bewitch a, a man whom she loves. Well, that's not something a Quaker priest should see. Okay, the result of this, as I said, is the shock in the two little girls who participated there also, uh, that they fall into an unconscious state where they are completely unresponsive. And the funny thing is when the father discovers their condition.
So one of the girls is the daughter of this priest. Okay, they discover this from a little bit louder, no? Yeah. Okay. So the local physician. <laughs> First mention of the devil. This is a political counterpart to the priest. He yes. doesn't like the priest. I agree with Reverend Harris. Good day to you, sir. Okay. What we observe here is still a very normal way of talking about things in a village. It's what I call a consensual discourse. A consensual discourse means that the locals, the people, are free actually to utter what they want to say to utter various, even if you want, contradictory opinions. And you act upon a common sense, your commonsensical understanding. And even when the first mentions of, of witchcraft pop up, come up by one of these women here, the locals are free to express doubt about witchcraft. No, that's not the witchcraft. Just let's wait. Maybe they wake up sometime. So locals can be in favor of or against the interpretation of witchcraft, which is important to remember this. And at the same time, you can observe that the richer people in this community develop or realize that they have a personal interest. And, uh, but these interests are still kept in bay, so to say, are kept under control. So actually, after the girls have been healed a day later, everything could go its normal way in the community and continue according to common sense. For example, uh, I will not go through this discourse because we have not so much time. Let's continue in the development of this whole plot. And it's important to observe now to have an eye on the first steps towards institutionalization, because this brings a big change in the tone of the whole, uh, of the whole climate in the village. Okay, so what he does is he's trying to reflect upon what to do and one of the reactions, one of the actions that he takes in Paris, the, 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 the priest, is to think of making a, 
uh, organizing a meeting in the church in order to announce, announce official act actions against the against the oh God where are we here So he announced already a meeting in church. So the more intelligent people start to sense the danger that's possibly evolving out of this uh, meeting and of making everything official. And they are actually right in doing so. Okay, let's pass by this one. Let us find out how to do this. So that's the first step towards institutionalization. Once you have a meeting and you officially announce official steps towards saluting, uh, uh, solving the problem by, for example, inviting an exorcist, this is a first step where it's difficult to, to get out again. Very, very polite way of dealing <laughs> with this little girl. Uh, okay, the last time in this whole plot, there is a there is a reasonable voice being heard. That's the Mrs. Nurse, who is a poor but very respected person. Um, after that, and I will not show this clip because we don't have so much time. Uh, after that, the discourse is going to be completely different. The books are important signs, you know, the symbols of institution of the written word that you cannot contradict, where the truth is real, formally. Okay. So they find the first victim. This is a very realistic example, actually. The first victims are the most helpless. 
the, the poor helpless people that meet the first violence. But anyway, the hail, the, the first person that arrived in order to combat uh, the devil's deeds uh, is not very successful and at the end he suggests, he recommends to invite the official court to Salem. And uh, the court arrives here. Okay, the court arrives, and this is really the final step in the reification or in the construction of an institution. And with an institution, an institution always has an object and a, a, a reason to exist, and in this case it is the reason of this court is to establish the fact of witchcraft. So now we have the first defendants. Now, Sarah Osborne, here is Sarah Good. Again, the poor the members of the group. I bid you follow her example. She testifies that when the devil came to her, you were in his company. Oh, finish, George. It is like him and her. And Osborne, right her name in his book with her own red blood. Oh, I never see the devil. This may look really ridiculous, but in psychological experiments it was shown that in situations of insecurity, in situations where people do not really feel in control, they have a higher tendency to believe in unreasonable things, in irrational uh, activities, irrational uh, decisions or irrational uh, explanations of things. So it's not a surprise actually that uh, in such a court case these unbelievable accusations of the old man, you know, flying into the, uh, the window of a young girl is uh, actually believed. Even nowadays you can create situations where this appears plausible, believable. Just think of Lottery. You know lottery? This is playing against the odds of 1 to 10 million. Okay. The, the participation in lottery increases always when there is a crisis. When insecurity arises in a society, when people feel not being anymore in control of their lives, when things impinge on them, then 
they tend more and more to believe that they may win in a lottery, which is absolutely ridiculous in a way, statistically at least. So we have many people who, who enter the discourse. And all this goes ahead with a certain logic, the logic of justice in this case, uh, justice 300 years ago, which is incorporated in this wonderful example of the logic. I call to defend these people. I promise you I should be confounded. Consider now, in an ordinary crime, witnesses are called to prove guilt or innocence, but witchcraft is an invisible crime. Therefore, who may witness it? The witch, of course, and the victim. Now, we cannot expect the witch to accuse herself, can we? Therefore, we may only rely upon her victims, and the children certainly testify. Therefore, what is left for a lawyer to bring out? But this is what claims the girls are not truthful. That is precisely what I am about to consider. What more may you ask of me? Mr. Herrick. So you see, as difficult as it is today to find, uh, uh, how shall I say, to find uh, a good judgment in a court case, it's dif uh, as difficult it was. 300 years ago, particularly with witches. So let's be happy we have no witches anymore, not in this strict sense. So what we see here is a very strong institutionalized discourse, something that is very well illustrated, I think, in this whole thing. So what is the characteristics of an institutionalized discourse in comparison to the consensual discourse before? where people were free to say whatever they think and nobody would harm them for anything. The exorcist follows a relatively strict version of rituals and practices and uh, whatever you as a participant in the village, as a, a villager, are thinking and talking becomes more or less regulated, delimited uh, by norms and formal rules and common sense is going to play a much less important uh, role in the conversations and in the discourse uh, which takes on a different tone. The tone changes particularly as you could see in the movie. Uh, you must take care of what you say because uh, nobody can be safe not to be accused or not to be among the accused. And uh, according to the logic of the judge we saw at the end, it would have been difficult to convince him or her, or in this case him, uh, to, uh, that you're not, a, not a, a, a witch. And that's an important thing. You cannot anymore negate that witchcraft exists or is uh, active here. Because in the moment you do it, you become suspicious. It it's makes you uh, suspicious and people may believe that you yourself are a witch. So something that you could do in the, before in the consensual discourse is impossible now because it becomes dangerous to say witchcraft does not exist. So what are other characteristics? The community increasingly start to accuse each other, of course, and they start to think of how they can make a profit out of the situation, how they can use accusations in order to gain more land, for example. 
And as I said, this global insecurity allows superstition to blossom, uh, such that uh, impossible events, irrational things, appear as believable, are being accepted. And consensual discourse, in contrast, is characterized by shades of gray. Not necessarily 99 shades of gray. Was it 99 in the movie, the last, the recent one? Sorry, I don't know exactly. Has nobody seen this movie? 99 shades of gray? Hasn't been here yet? OK, good. Uh, I haven't seen it either. Um, but consensual discourse is characterized by shades of gray. Whereas in the institutionalized discourse, you have only black and white. Black and white, no, nothing in between. And this is, I think, a good example of propaganda. In propaganda, we have the same problem. The same problem that media and discursive sources start to argue only in black and white. Whenever you can observe this in your own newspapers or in the media, in the electronic media also, once they start to once they start massively, as many, many newspapers and media, start massively to be arguing in one line that there is one negative person, one enemy, and there is only one friend, one uh, good person, this black-white picture. If you have this and observe this in the media, for example, with regard to a political problem, then you can be sure that this is a kind of an expression of propaganda. That is more or less uh, in a, taking the frame of an institutionalized situation. And of course, the power of the written word that is expressed in books uh, uh, signals for us that we have or are facing a hermetic language that is uh, very well reflected in this uh, conversation here between Paris and Hale when he asks about what is this book, and Hale explains what is this book with this wonderful text here. For example, talking about the devil in all his brute disguises, the familiar spirits, the incubi and succubi, etc., by which the witches go land, uh, by land and by air, etc., etc. So the Hermetic language is usually has the, re the, 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 the sense or the task uh, to quieten, to, sh to make you shut up, not to criticize anymore, not to question anything. Many religions have this. So against this you cannot say anything because you will be seen as a heretic. And nowadays we even have a problem you know, if you're in a forum and you <coughs> dare to utter or to post something which is not politically correct, you can be sure to, 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 to be attacked by, a, as it's called, a shitstorm. So very similar uh, situation. We can transport what is being described in this play very well to certain situations in our modern life. So. The material consequences, how the social representation of witchcraft becomes a material reality, is depicted here. So a total of 22 dead people, following out of the first accusations of witchcraft and of the doings of the devil. A terribly material 
consequence of this whole procedure, which is true actually. It's, uh, the, the, the play depicts or is uh, located or was taken from a real fact, events that occurred in Salem in reality 300 years ago. Okay. So what we see here is how ideas turn into facts. And the facts uh, are the executions of 22 people. But let's go back to the role of interests, of your subjective interests that you bring into conversations and into social construction. Whenever you participate and act within such settings, you bring in your own motivations, of course. This may be May, ha may have many different sources. It may be jealousy, it may be greed, it may be whatever, whatever, whatever. So, in a way, every single peop uh, person acts as he or she sees useful and in concert with other people. But taken together, they co-construct the social fact that is at issue in, uh, at present. But you co-construct the social fact without conscious planning, without uh, really wanting 22 people to die out of it. You participate because you're motivated, for example, by your greed. You want more land from this old man who was hanged at the end. So you're unwittingly, actually, participating in the social representation and in the co-construction of the fact of social, of, of, of which graph. So every person acts with good reasons, but nevertheless, the, the outcome is a terribly uh, depressing result. And together they all construct the social fact of which graph. In this sense, social construction is an unintended and emergent phenomenon, a process, notwithstanding some, some games of power which uh, play a role also. But what I want to say is that social construction, or what we call social construction, what happens all the time when we co-act with regard to a certain issue, is an unintended, mostly unintended and emergent phenomenon and it's very hard and difficult to anticipate what's coming out of it. So if we summarize a bit, how do you create witches? First, of course, in the mutual co-construction in talking and in acting. And it's not important if you personally believe in witchcraft or not. In the moment you participate in the discord, you, you participate in the construction. Because even negating something presupposes the existing of, existence of the concept of the representation. You remember maybe at the beginning I asked uh, a colleague from you if she is the seventh rebirth holy dog. She couldn't tell me yes or no. But if I had asked her if she was participant in some, uh, in some political uh, activity earlier, she could have said, yes, I was, or no, I was not. And even by saying, no, she was not, she's actually mentioning this political event and confirms that it exists in her world. Yeah, that it is part of her world. And of course, witchcraft does not exist, if you remember the the four basic rules by Kenneth Gurgen does not exist due to some rational scientific objective uh, evidence. But of course, because a bunch of people believe in it and act as if the, the, the thing that we call witchcraft, as if it existed. And finally, of course, the construction, the unwitting construction of the fact of witchcraft results in the material fact of executions. And there is, as I said, 
no more material proof than killing somebody. We have modern examples, of course. We can observe them in the Near East, in several fundamentalist religions like Christians, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, etc., etc. We have processes of xenophobia that develop sometimes a very similar dynamics and construct the, the other written large, the other as something completely different from us. We have phenomena of nationalism and the last 10 years, the moral execution of smokers. I mean, this was a very interesting process going on because more and more uh, with the uh, condemnation of the act of smoking in the public or let's say in a pub. Uh, you remember the pubs that had this wonderful smell of smoke <laughs> in the air? You cannot find them anymore, but this is a result that was the moral execution of the smoking people who now have to freeze outside of the doors. Anyway, or of course traffic jams. This may not sound very, very logical, but traffic jams are another good example. Let's look at traffic jams. I'm trying to understand where I can get, get that going. <laughs> uh, it's so frustrating if you're standing outside here and uh, it doesn't work. Try to press the space bar. No, then it goes to the next. Uh, okay, I will search for this in in the folder. Okay. Here is the folder. Here is the movie. Yes. They made a group of cars. A group of cars. A group of cars go uh, around about Equi uh, with equal distances <coughs> and in the same speed, 30 kilometers per hour, which is not fast, actually. And everybody was keeping to the, to the, the speed. It just takes one person to briefly break or to accelerate a bit. And suddenly, this whole system breaks down, OK? You can see here, just a little acceleration and then braking because you don't want to hit the other car. Just produces a phenomenon that, as you can see here, is produces a wave of braking and of accelerating that suddenly destroys the whole system. And this may not sound like a, wonderful, like a good example of social construction, but it is because the individual motivations that the drivers bring into the situation are, for example, on a freeway or on the big road from Tartu to Tallinn, are, well, to come home on time, to meet the children, to see the spouse, etc. So they have all very rational reasons to drive as they drive. And of course, they don't want to hit another car. They want to maintain their car in a good condition. So, nevertheless, and because they are driving in a rational way, they produce traffic jams in certain situations of density of a dense traffic, even though logically it would not be necessary. But it is the coincidental uh, effects, the unconsciously accelerating or unconsciously breaking at a time when it's not really necessary, that makes the, the, the whole traffic, uh, uh, how shall I say, snake, on the, uh, the, the snake of cars on the street suddenly uh, produce a traffic jam because of, as a collective phenomenon. So in a way, the jam is an emergent phenomenon, as it is, as we have seen from the other 
witchcraft example. And it is a good analogy, I think, to the socially constru social construction of effect because the phenomenon of the gem is on the collective level and the individual motivations and behaviors are on the individual level. And even though nobody wants or intends a gem, a traffic gem, it just happens. It just happens because it is, uh, because it is uh, the interaction between the collective system and the individual behavior that makes that gem emerge. OK, let's uh, characterize this at the end again. Oh, no. Sorry. Where am I here? Let me see. Yeah, OK. Um, if you look at the role of power, uh, we can see several connection points where we can insert the discussion of power. Let's not go into this right now. I just had it here in case we had more time. Let's stop here and let's say that, uh, let's not forget about social construction. Let's be aware of what we do when we participate in, in, in collective events. Let's be conscious of what can be the consequences of that. Because if everybody or most of the people who are conscious in participating, not participating, or in trying to influence a collective event in a way that is, uh, that will conduce or bring about a good result, then we have a chance to avoid some of the bad effects of social construction. Thank you very much. Anything you want to discuss maybe on this? Any comments, questions? No. Nope.